come to this place today in baptism in the Spirit and turn to Acts chapter 9. Well, we'll start in Acts chapter 18. If you haven't got a Bible, it'll be on screen. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 18, verse 24. And we're only going to read that for a little bit, and then we're going to jump straight to 19. I'll give you a time to thumb those pages just so you can find it. So that's Acts chapter 18, verse 24. And then when I tell you, we'll jump to Acts chapter 19. So if you flick past the first screen up the top, you'll get a load of songs. There we go. Super. Here we go. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. The point of that passage is to say that Apollos only knew John's baptism and he was teaching accurately about Jesus. He was passionate about Jesus, but he only knew John's baptism. We jump now to chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is Jesus in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illness were cured. And the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man the men who had evil spirits had a, the man who had an evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding when this became known to the jews and the greeks living in ephesus they were all seized with fear and the name of the lord jesus was held in high honor many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Lord, we pray that this word might have meaning for us today, and we pray that you will speak it regardless of the one delivering it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Several years ago, I was invited to speak with some Mormons, and we sat down and we chatted for a little while, and we were trying to decide the way to go. There was three of them, and and as we chatted, I felt that the right thing to do would be to share testimony. So we shared our testimony in how we came to know Jesus, and to put it bluntly, their testimony was very much about how they joined a religion, how they joined something that they grew up in, and 
as we went around as Christians and shared our testimony, at the end of it, these Mormons, when they decided to leave, walked over and the guy said, your testimony will never, ever leave me. And I thought to myself, are you a closet Christian? Are you giving yourself away? And here's the thing. Christianity, the true Christianity, is about an encounter with God. Unless you encounter the living God, there is nothing going to change in your life. And at any time you could be taken away from your faith when you lose heart. But when you truly have a faith in the living Lord Jesus Christ, and when you have encountered him, it changes everything. And that is the Christianity that we preach here. That is the Christianity that we read about in the Bible. The very first time in Antioch, when they first revealed their name as Christians, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about a faith that is not built on books and words. It's built on a living encounter with the living God, which will change everything about you and everywhere you go. It's not the same in every faith. It's only if you have faith in Jesus. The true Christian conversion is one that must start with faith given to you by God. He calls you in. And it's repentance. It comes with repentance. It comes with baptism in water. And it, becomes, it comes with baptism in the Holy Spirit. That is a normal Christian conversion. That you believe, that you repent, and that you are baptized in water, and you are baptized in the Spirit, and you go on being filled with the Spirit. It doesn't have to come in that order. Sometimes, within the Bible, just to give you proof, it does say that there are people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit before they are baptized in water. So what we see here is it doesn't have to go in that order, but you must, you must have the Holy Spirit in you, and you will if you believe. But that is the normal conversion of a Christian. But the question I have to ask you today is what is your experience of being a Christian? Is it one of turning up to church as a young person and, and leading through that life? Uh, is it one where you kind of believe the words in the, in the Bible and, and, and you believe in Jesus so therefore you are saved? But is it one of empowerment? Is it one of meeting with God in such a way that you hear his still small voice, you encounter him day to day, and that you have this power within you that you don't really understand, but at times God calls you to step out in faith and to exercise it? Is that the encounter you've had, or is it one of just turning up to church and warming the seats? And I ask you today, if it's the latter, would you like more? Would you like more in your Christian faith? Because what we see in this passage, and the first point today is an incomplete message. The two things that stand out within verse 1 of chapter 19 is this. Apollos and these disciples that Paul comes into encounter. And in chapter 18, it says Apollos had an incomplete message. It said that he believed in Jesus, he taught well of Jesus. However, he only had John's baptism. And then what, they, what he has in common with these disciples that are also met within this, this passage is that they also only knew John's baptism. They only had John's baptism. Now here's the thing. Something, something in Paul when he met these Jesus-loving Christians caused him to be disturbed about where they're at. He didn't just go, oh great, we're all Christians, that's great, everything's fine. He saw something in them, and I don't know what it is, it doesn't tell us what it is, but he saw something within them that caused them to say, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Doesn't do it all the time. We see it here possibly twice, where they're asked, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He saw something within these people that wasn't quite right. He knew that they were okay, he knew that they believed, but he just knew there was something missing. And they replied to him like this, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And Paul then replies to them like this, then what did you receive? And then they replied, the baptism of John. What is the problem with the baptism with John? The baptism of John doesn't go far enough. The baptism of John, which Paul quite rightly points out, is one of pointing to Jesus. It's one of repentance only. It's about coming to God and saying, I'm a sinner and, and, and please forgive me. And God forgives you. But then he said something very clear when he was bringing people to him. He said, there is one coming after me. I'm not even worthy to untie their sandals. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Now that word fire is an interesting word. It can have a lot of negative 
temptations in some respects throughout the Bible because it is one that comes and does a deep work within you. It's a consuming fire. It's a fire that comes in to consume. And as it consumes, it comes to burn up the chaff so that you become pure, so that you lose those things in your life that are causing you to be kept from being in God's presence. But also we see in Pentecost that uh, tongues like fire. It doesn't say tongues of fire. It says tongues like fire in the translation. It says came down and settled on them. And it was this idea that that there was going to be this real change in their characters. But there was also going to be this empowerment that came with it. And we learn also that people were speaking in different languages. They were empowered. But something greater was coming than John's baptism. John's baptism was just a precursor pointing to the one that would come after him. And the one that came after him was going to give you so much more than just repentance. But repentance is needed. He was going to give you power and he was going to empower you to go on and do the work. What we have here is some people that loved Jesus but had an incomplete message. And because of that incomplete message, they had an incomplete fullness of life in Jesus Christ today. And it's like I said at the beginning of this series that Toza wrote that if they were to remove the Holy Spirit from the church, 95% would go on and you wouldn't notice any difference within the church. And it's true. It's very, very, very true that actually we are very good at running churches. In fact, if you go to America particularly, they have it all sewn up. They've got all the right executives in the right positions and the right money for the right things and they get everything done and go and for- church there and not every single church here is full of the Spirit of God. And in fact, if you had no money and no building, but you had the Spirit of God, you would see an incredible church working in incredible ways in their communities. You don't need money, you don't need buildings, but graciously God gives it to us. And where there's no Holy Spirit, there's no change, there's no empowerment, there's nothing different. To be baptized, the word baptized means to be totally immersed. That means completely dunked. When we dunk people in the water down here for baptism, we don't do dib, dab, dob just on the head. We fully wash them in the blood of Jesus, but we only have water because that would be inappropriate. And we do that so that it's, it's symbolic of saying they are fully covered by the blood of Jesus, forgiven, not just their finger, not just their toe, but every part of them, spiritually and physically, is washed and forgiven by Jesus. Baptism in water. But then Jesus has promised us baptism in the Holy Spirit. Not just your finger. You don't want just a powerful finger. You're going out and doing lots of things with that finger. He's saying everything about you will be completely immersed in my Holy Spirit. Do you think we might miss someone that is filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing? Do you think it's possible that if someone is full, filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that if they walk down the road, we would miss them? I don't think you, we would. I don't think you could. People should not be able to miss us. There should be 300, 400 strong people going out every week and just looking very odd compared to the ways of the world. I went into a school playground. We had this wonderful uh, thing going on at at Dover's Green whereby our toddlers' uh, mums that work in the toddlers and service here, they wear these T-shirts on the back. It says, loving people, loving God, or loving God, loving people, and they have it all over them. And I get people that I preached at their churches come to me and say, Mike, did you see the God squad on on, on on the playground? Isn't it wonderful? And I said, well, that's my wife. You know, she is quite wonderful. And she said, it's amazing. I love it. But this same woman this week came up to me. She goes, Mike, you never guess what happened to me. I said, what? She said, I'm walking down the road, and there's this woman coming opposite me. And she said, God spoke to me and said, tell her she's precious. And she said, I had that very quick internal, please don't make me do this. And she said, then I stepped out and said, excuse me, I know you don't know me, but God says you're precious. The woman just burst into tears. She said, I was walking along the road there, and I just thought inside me, no one thinks I'm precious. And then this woman said to her, God thinks you're precious. That's, you know, let me just get it out there. I'm just looking around at some faces. Some of you are struggling to believe that. Some of you are struggling to believe that. Your Christian walk will be so normal if you don't start to believe that God can speak like that. Your Christian walk will be so lackluster. You will always find church as that thing you do rather than that thing that you are 
if you don't get to that place where you believe that God can speak to you daily. You cannot miss a spirit-filled Christian. You cannot do it. It is impossible. They will get on your nerves, if, if at the least they will get on your nerves, because they are so filled with the Spirit that they God, they can't contain it. They are overflowing to the point that it will annoy you or it will transform you, one or the other. But the question is, do we want to be church attenders with a, an incomplete message and an incomplete fullness, or do we want to be people that go out and take part in God's unfolding, ongoing story, which he invites us to be part of and he empowers us to be central with it? Which one do we want to be? An incomplete a nearly Christian. I mean, you still have faith, you're still saved, but you're not quite doing the full role of Christianity, which is to go out and transfer the world. Do we want to be that, or do we want to be the ones that have experienced the fullness of God? I've lived both, and at times I still live the incomplete one because we have to keep on going. Which brings me to incomplete fullness. Verse five. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Now, I want to be clear. If you believe in Jesus Christ, and you really believe in him in your heart, and you have repented and received him in your heart, you are saved. You are saved. You don't have to worry. I'm not saying anything about that. You are still a Christian. We're talking about whether you want to be one that, that, that is like a rabbit on steroids, or whether you want to be one that is just, you know, dead. You know, you have this choice between the two. And here's the thing. Ephesians 1 confirms this in verse 13. It says, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of our salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal with the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit. The question you need to ask yourselves as a Christian is, that, that verse in Ephesians says, you have received the Holy Spirit because you believe. But you have to ask you the question, is he got the full reign to everything that you are? Is he allowed to conduct the affairs in your life in every way possible? When you're buying something, when you're talking to someone, when you're going somewhere, when you're deciding to go to this comedian or that thing, whatever it might be, does he make your stomach go, oh, I don't feel that's quite right? Is he in full reign in your life? Is he the person that will speak to you and say, that lady is precious? And will you say, no, I'm definitely not doing that? Or will you go and look stupid for Christ? Foolish. Which one is it? Which one is it? I had a, a friend that was given a role in a church and he went to this church and the pastor left that church very quickly and he sort of got given the reins. Very young and, and he was there and the eldership team in this church gave him no authority. So he was in the position of pastor but he did not have the authority to make any changes. So effectively, all he could do is turn up and lead services and got kicked from pillow to post and had no real voice which is the most disastrous thing you can ever do to a pastor. I've not experienced it, thank you to our leadership. They are fantastic. But what I would say is what happened to that church is it got stuck. And what happened to that pastor is he got burnt out and he had to leave that church and went out of ministry. And when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we should be thinking, do we want him to be without a voice in us or to be shrinking within us and to be making no change in us? Or do we want the Holy Spirit to come and transform us and our surroundings to the point that we are overflowing with his goodness and his power and his mercy. Which one would we like to be? Because let's not forget that Jesus himself, when he went along and he was walking down the road, a woman came and touched his garment and he turned and he said, who touched me? He said, I felt the power go out. What it tells us is that we leak. In this room today, I can tell you that there are lots of vessels with nothing in it. Just a little bit. Just the Holy Spirit's there, and he's holding you up, but there's just nothing evident in it in many places in this room. Don't be offended. I'm looking at a mirror. Because what I'm saying to you is that we leak the Holy Spirit. If Jesus had the power go out, and if he leaked the power of the Holy Spirit, then how much more are we leaking the power of the Holy Spirit? That when you first ever experienced God in his fullness, when you experienced that, if you've experienced that fullness, that if that was your last experience, you are not now walking in the fullness of the Spirit. If that was the last time you can remember that God filled you with his Spirit. Because Paul says, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to desire him more and more and more. In fact, I was thinking this week, maybe there are some people here today that was filled with the Holy Spirit, experienced the fullness of God, but you've made some wrong choices in your life. That too will make that hole that the the Holy Spirit is leaking out even bigger and even quicker. We think about Samson. Samson was on my heart as I was praying. We know that the story of Samson is is that he was a very strong man when filled with the Holy Spirit. There was one secret to his strength. It was the Holy Spirit, and if he cut his hair, he would not have that power anymore. So one day, he released that in disobedience to his his lover, and, and she then turned on him and got people to come and kill him. He was emptied of the Holy Spirit because of disobedience. Because he re- released the secret of his powers and he had his hair cut. He didn't choose for it, but he gave away that information and therefore they cut his hair. How many of us have lost the fullness of the Spirit? How many of us have leaked so much that we cannot even sense him in us anymore because we've made some wrong choices? The great news for you is, is that can change today. It doesn't have to stay that way. It can change today. A number of years ago, I moved into a house And I moved into this house, and the boiler was rubbish. And the radiators did not give the heat that I wanted. It was just a very, very cool house. And I'm like, what is going on? So I ring up this this Scottish power, whoever they were, southern something or other, and they send this guy around, and they're offering this plan where they would take care of the boiler. But in order to get me on that plan, the boiler had to be working. Isn't that interesting? And so this guy comes out, and I said, look, it's not working. He says, you need to replace your pipes. I'll do it. So I pay all this money to get these pipes replaced, not fixed. Next thing I know, I ring him up and say, it's still not working. Next guy comes out and says, oh, you need to replace that valve there. I'm like, okay, how much is that going to cost? A big sum. So he, reply, he replaced that. He went away. And I ring him up and say, it's still not working. I still can't feel the heat. This boiler is rubbish, and I need your help. Well, the next guy comes around, and he looks at the boiler. The boiler's working fine, but the heating just doesn't seem to be heating up. He just checked the boiler, and then he signed it off and said, great, you're on the plan. I said, that's fantastic. So I called him back again. I said, look, I'm on your plan now. You know, I know he made a mistake, but you did it. I said, you need to come back out again. It's still not heating up my house. So they came out, and now they would be paying for it. And so this guy comes out in the snow, and he stands there, he looks around, he goes, oh, yeah. I said, your guy said it needs to be flushed out. It needs this thing to take out all the dirt. Can you do that? Oh, it's getting late today, and it's cold, and it's snowing. I said, you're feeling the cold. How do you think I feel when it's snowing and there's no heating in here? I said, listen, on your plan, it says if you keep coming out and you can't fix it, you can place the boiler. How does that sound? You're feeling excited about that one? And he looked at me like, no. He said, give me a minute. He went into the kitchen, he opened the cupboard underneath, and he turned this little red tap thing. He goes, oh, it seems to be fixed. Oh, it's just that that tap wasn't turned on properly and the flow wasn't right. He goes, oh, look, problem solved. And I looked at him like, have you not been having me on for this time? But you know, the thing is, that sometimes is where many Christians are at. That actually, we are meant to be radiating God's love. We're meant to be radiating the power of God. We're meant to be giving warmth everywhere we go. But sometimes we walk around like anyone else, like life is just such a burden. And actually, some people think, that Christian's miserable. Don't want to be one like here. But is it that we just need to ask God to turn that tap back on again? Is it that we just need to ask him again to come and fill us with his Holy Spirit? It's not magic. It's his power. Because God wants us to flow freely. He wants us to fill everywhere we go with love. So what will happen when we lay hands on each other and pray for each other in the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? What will happen to us? Well, the first thing is, I'm sorry to say, it's trouble. It's trouble. Listen to this. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them were obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Actually, the sign of someone that is filled with the Holy Spirit is usually that they hit opposition. Why do they hit opposition? Because the message they carry and so freely give offends the people around them. Billy Graham said that the cross is an offense. It is a scandal to the world. It is an absolute offense to the world. What you carry is an offense. If you don't say anything about it, it won't be an offense and you'll be fine. But if you are filled with the Spirit, the first thing you will hit will be trouble. And some of us will be sitting here today, what, what happens when people lay hands on us? You know, when I first became a Christian, I was in a New Frontiers church, and I'm standing there going, yep, yeah, go on, pray for me in the Spirit. And I'm standing there, and they're going, just speak in tongues. And I look at them like, we 
What do you mean just speak in tongues? You know, I've never spoken in tongues in my life before. How am I going to do that? Just open your mouth. And I'm standing there going, yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing. And at the end of the day, I went home thinking, you know, I, I like the idea that they were interested, but honestly, just speaking tongues, why didn't it work? So for the next few weeks, I sat in my car driving to work going, please, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Please, Lord. Nothing happened. Not on the time when we prayed, not even after the time. And then one day, I woke up in the middle of the night, baptized, fully immersed in the Holy Spirit in a way that I cannot explain and give it full grandeur. I was in bed going, Lord, this love is amazing, even at three in the morning. And if you ask my wife, that's not usually the response. It was amazing. And I could feel this love going through me. And I said, Lord, if I die now, you know, I've got no dependence right now. It doesn't matter. I can come to heaven and I will be free. I had this assurance flowing through me that said, you are eternal. You are going to live forever. You are God's. You are loved. I had never experienced anything like it. I didn't fall over. I was already in bed. But what I'm trying, why am I telling you this? It's because I'm telling you this because I don't want you to get a theology and understanding of church that if you don't fall over, you won't be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or it all happens right here, right now. A lot of it does. But sometimes it's a peaceful moment. Some people, when they have their, their laid hands on, they just they stand there and there's this peace that goes over. Some people do fall over. God works in different ways in different people. People respond in different ways. Some people were just like we were, uh, I was running a, a conference for another church just two weeks ago, and we're there, and just this one woman just burst out laughing for the next half an hour and would not shut up. You know, I'm trying to minister from the front, and all I can hear is this woman having a giggle, and I think, is she having a laugh? God, why would you do that? You know, some people laugh. Some people shake. Some people look like not a lot is going on, but they come back with a testimony a few weeks later. Some people open their mouth, and tongues come out. Don't be afraid of tongues. Don't be afraid of tongues and don't be afraid of God because he loves you and he wants to fill you and he wants to gift you and he wants to be all up over you. But you must believe that actually there's more than John's baptism. That's an incomplete message. And you, know, you may have an incomplete fullness. And if you've been a Christian for a long time and haven't experienced that fullness, then you can have it again. If you've never experienced, if you've been told that if you believe, you're saved and you are. So you repent and believe you're saved. But if you've never been told about that next step, which is that we can lay hands on you, you can ask God to be filled with his Holy Spirit and that power can be imparted into you, then why would you hold back? Why would you hold back? And you don't have to worry about looking like everyone else and doing everything else everyone else did. You just have to be open and go on being filled with the Holy Spirit and you will be changed. I bumped into a guy at the co-op yesterday. I used to play football with him. And he was a brilliant footballer, better than me. And he was hard. And uh, he seems to have had a change. He just seemed nice, which was a change. And, uh, but he said to me, he said, what are you doing nowadays? And I said, I'm a pastor. He said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit coming in and filling you changes you, just have a look at my resume. Seriously. It is a funny one. Uh, at least... It is just very, very strange. But God comes in and does something. You're not all going to become great big preachers. But what you might find is this, is that you might become a better witness for Christ. You might become, I can't contain it. In fact, you may not become a better witness. You might just become a, a bigger witness. You know, I've met some people that are filled with the Spirit that are terrible witnesses. But you can't shut them up. But they are just so overflowing with Jesus. And even though they don't quite know how to do it sometimes, they just need some discipleship. But they are overflowing that you cannot miss it. The other thing, the thing that always gets me is when you preach the longer sermon and, uh, and everyone's okay about it, apart from one person that comes up to you, I still think 20 minute sermons would be much better. <laughs> I've got to tell you, I was that person years ago until I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And 40 minute sermons became like 10 minute sermons because I was on the edge of my seat hungering for more, saying, God, feed me, feed me. I want to hear more. Something changes in you when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Something I cannot explain or give to you, something changes. Quite often in the New Testament, in Acts, it was laying on of hands and it was uh, speaking in tongues and it was prophesying. Don't be afraid of that. Paul said, do all speak in tongues. The, the Greek structure for that, although some will argue this, but I'll have it after, it says it because he's saying, no, not everyone speaks in tongues. He says himself, I wish that you would all speak more in tongues like I do. You know, but I say this, everyone can ask for every gift and it is available to every person and he, the Spirit, will enable you as he chooses. That's scriptural. 
That's what we're talking about. If you don't speak in tongues, ask for it and go for it. I asked for it and I got it. What if I didn't speak in tongues, I wouldn't be that bothered. I was saying to Rachel this morning, if I had a choice between being in a setting with people coming in and speaking in tongues, falling over, being healed, or I could be in a place where people are just coming in in tears, giving their lives to Jesus, I'd take that one. I'd take that one. I'd like to see people know Jesus more than I'd like to see all the gifts flowing, although I'd like them both. And also, you can be deceived. I was reading yesterday a book, and a man that went to a conference, he was told that at this conference, there was this great healer guy in America, and he was a great prophet. So this guy's a great theologian, so he goes along to this meeting. His friend had thrown away his hearing aid because he had been healed the week before. So his friend says, come along. He goes into this meeting, and there's this prophet guy, comes off the stage, walks down, starts talking to people. And he says, do you believe in God? And the people would say, he'd stand them up one by one, and they'd say, yes. And then he said, do you believe I'm a prophet? And the person would say, yes, I believe you're a prophet. And they'd say, do you believe I've got a message for you today from God? Yes, I believe you've got a message from me today from God. And then he'd go on to tell them supposedly all this stuff about their lives. And they'd be like, wow. And, but this person that had gone to this meeting saw a book at the front as he was going in. And it was saying that Jesus' de- deity is not an eternal deity. So instantly he's like, this guy's not right. So he sits there and he says to his wife, he says, that guy's coming for me next. I know it in my spirit. He's coming. And uh, she said, oh, don't be stupid. So they're at the back. This guy comes over to them. He says, you, stand up. He says, do you believe in God? And this person said, yes, I believe in God. And then the prophet said to him, do you believe I'm a prophet? He said, no, I don't believe you're a prophet. And then he says to him, do you believe I have a message for you today from God? No, I don't believe I have a message for me today. You think the first one was a good hint, right? He says, do you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. Do you believe I'm a prophet? Just in case he didn't hear it probably. No, no, you're not a prophet. And he says, do you believe I have a message from you, for you? No, I don't believe you have a message. So just as this person was going to grab his mic and explain why, he walks off and says, ladies and gentlemen, there is a man that is on his way to hell. Do you want to know who the man was that's on his way to hell? R.T. Kendall. One of the best theologians I've ever read and one of the best preachers that you'll ever hear. We mustn't base our Christianity and the filling of the Holy Spirit based on lots of magic and lots of hyper preachers. I did think about wearing a white suit here today, just for a laugh. (laughs) You base your encounter with God on your encounter with God. That when we lay our hands on people and pray for them, we say, God, Come and fill this person with your Holy Spirit and do your work. Something may happen there and then. I expect it will. Sometimes it takes a bit longer and a bit more desire and a bit more walking towards God. And he does it like I did on the bed. But he won't do nothing. He will do something. He will do something. And I want you to know that every single one of us needs to desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Finally, an incomparable astonishment. When it became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. When Christians are filled with the Spirit, the communities around them will know it, and they will know that something is going on. Some will rebel, and some will come. That's what we're called to. Not only that, how would you feel today if you went into Rygate and you saw people on their knees, witches coming out saying, I used to be a pagan, I used to be a witch, I'm on my knees, I'm confessing to God. How would that feel to you? That if you was walking, saw people in bits before God. And we, we today think, well, it's a lovely idea, but it has happened. It has happened in the past. Let me read something to you that really struck me. This is what happens when God moves. We see it in this scripture, but listen to this. So a man... In 1801, so God was still alive in 1801. That's good to know, isn't it? His name was Barton Stone. And he went along to this meeting, just as R.T. Kendall did. And this is what he saw. Two or three of my particular acquaintances from a distance were struck down. I sat patiently by one of them, whom I knew to be a careless sinner for hours, and observed with critical attention everything that passed from the beginning to the end. I noticed the momentary revivings as from death, the humble confessions of sin, the fervent prayer, and the ultimate deliverance, then the solemn thanks and praise to God, the affectionate exhortation to companions and to the people around them to repent and come to Jesus. 
I was astonished at the knowledge of gospel truth displayed in their address. The effect was that several sunk down into the same appearance of death. After attending to many such cases, my conviction was complete that it was a good work, the work of God. Nor has my mind wavered since on the subject. Much did I see and much have I seen since that I consider to be fanaticism. But this should not condemn that work. The devil has always tried to ape the works of God, to bring them into disrepute. But that cannot be a satanic work, which brings a man to humble confession and forsaking of sin, the solemn prayer, the fervent praise and thanksgiving, and the sincere and affectionate exhortations to sinners to repent and go to Jesus. 1801. Man turns up to a meeting much like this and people start to fall around them and are almost like dead. And all of a sudden they are just repenting and praising God and singing. And then they're getting up and then they are preaching and other people are experiencing the same thing. 1801, we're like we hit the, uh, the Holy Spirit movement like 1980 or something. It's like it came to us first. It's been going on for years. And God is ready to pour out his spirit in every one of us. He wants us to lay hands and to pray for each other regularly so that we are continually filled with God's Holy Spirit. And that's why I want to end today. I want to say to you that if the band would like to come back, I want to say to you today that don't settle for an incomplete message. John the Baptist was never meant to be the way. He was the one pointing to the way. He was the one clearing the way. He was saying, come and repent so that when Jesus comes up, his Holy Spirit. And I want to say to you today, have you settled the message of I will turn up to church and be a Christian? Or do you want the complete fullness and astonishment of Jesus wants to fill you, he wants to gift you, and he wants to use you, and he wants to speak to you, and he wants to love you. And if you're feeling empty, we're going to have an opportunity now to just gently lay hands on you. We have a team available and to pray for God's fullness to come into your heart and into your lives once again or for the first time or for the millionth time. Some of you may experience something. Some of you may speak in tongues. Some of you may do something that I don't even know. But God is here and he's ready to move. So why don't you stand with me? I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to just move among us in these next songs of worship. And then I'm going to invite you as you're ready to come forward and be prayed for. And we'll have a team here, good, gentle, anointed people that have been handpicked to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you. Heavenly Father, we don't want to just be church attenders. We want to be people that attend church and get filled with your Holy Spirit. And I want to pray today, dear Lord, that as we're standing here, that you will be speaking into our hearts. And Lord, for any disappointment that we may have had in the past, I pray today that you will demolish those. I pray today, dear Lord, for any strongholds that may be in place, that today you'll break them. I pray today for anything that stands in the way of people knowing you in, their, in your fullness to be broken. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will be pushing people to come forward into this space to just be prayed for and to receive the fullness of your spirit. So Lord, come among us now as we prepare our hearts for you and cause us to know if we're meant to come forward. In Jesus' name, amen.